So, uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Sherrod Lin. I'm with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center, and I'm also a member of the South Bay uh, Political Alliance. Progressive. Uh, Progressive Alliance. <laughs> and uh, I just want to welcome all of you here. Uh, I was supposed to be... Speak into the mic. Speak into the mic. I can't hear you. Can, can you hear me in the back now? Closer, a little, little louder, or turn it off. Closer to you. Is that good? Nice yeah. uh, is, that, is that loudspeaker in that word? Yes. 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 What loudspeaker? All right. So, um, so the so I was supposed to be the the MC for for this evening, but my my is throat is probably is probably. Is from your mouth. His, his throat is bad. Rock and roll. My, my throat is probably going to give up, and, and so I'm not going. Uh, so my scene has. Has, has gracefully uh, agreed to uh, be uh, a co-moderator. So, that's what, but I, but I do want because of the significance of of this event of, of what we are doing here in California, I, I felt that you know I couldn't just simply sit on the on the sidelines uh, tonight. Right? Uh, I, I've been many of you know that that I've been advocating for for decades. Uh, against the or, or complaining for decades about the, the two-party dictatorship in this country, and so, you know, so yes, this has been going on for a long time. But you know, why are we gathered here now? Why is this an opportune moment, an historic moment, uh, to to organize and and to collaborate uh, on on a, on a whole new political venture, and so. One reason is, is because the, the two monopoly parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, are, are at, a, at a point where both of them are, are showing unprecedented fissures within, within those parties. So, so we've got the, the Democrats, which traditionally have had a fissure between the, the corporate Democrats and, and the union Democrats, mm -hmm. and, and now we have the, the Bernie Democrats, right? So there, there actually are three streams. In, in the Democratic Party that are, that are going in, in diverse directions. In the Republican Party, we have the evangelicals, we have the corporate Republicans, and then we have Trump's populism, right? Uh, and, and so, once again, there are, there are multiple streams that, that, are, that, that <coughs> could tear these parties apart. What has happened in, in the election of 2016 is a, is a, is a demonstration that, uh, that the American people want something different. We, we are tired of the same old thing from, from the, the establishments of these same two parties. Okay? So, so that's why we're gathered here today. I don't want to take too much more time, but I wanted to point out that I, I, when I saw who is, who's running here in California, I, I realized that we may actually have something going here that although it wasn't organized that way, but it reminds me of something that, that happens in India. In India, there is something called a poll alliance. And so what a poll alliance is, is that, for example, if you have multiple parties on the left, they, they will agree that, that and one party will, have the, will run for this parliamentary seat. Another party will run for that parliamentary seat. And so they don't compete with each other. And that's how they actually win those seats, is through poll alliances. And so when I see that you know Gloria Lariva is running for governor, Gail McLaughlin for lieutenant governor, uh, C.T. Weber for secretary of state, uh, Kevin Aiken for, for state treasurer, and Eric Ritberg for sec secretary of state, you see that, that, that it's, it's hopefully it's going to work out that way, and these people are going to get enough votes to really make a difference. So, so I'm really thrilled at, at this possibility. So with that, uh, I guess you know that w what we're going to do is we're going to uh, introduce the, the individual uh, candidates. And I guess I'll, I'll just start with the, with, the, with the first one. We're going to have Gail McLaughlin. Uh, Gail McLaughlin is the, the former two-term mayor and council member of Richmond, California. In 2003, she co-founded the Richmond Progressive Alliance. And the Richmond Progressive Alliance is an inclusive, diverse, corporate-free, uh, year-round, that means it, it, it works between elections, uh, uh, for a progressive organization based on people's values rather than party affiliation 
and that runs corporate free candidates for local office. So, so none of their candidates take a dime of, of corporate money. Uh, Gail has never, and Gail also has, of course, never, never taken a dime of corporate money and has repeatedly triumphed over the, this, the, the, um, over, over the money, the massive amounts of money, millions of dollars that, that Chevron has poured into the elections in, in Richmond. Over her 12 and a half years of elected service, Gail has won many awards for her leadership. She is currently a corporate fee candidate for Lieutenant Governor of the State of California. Yeah. Would it be possible if I could stand? Uh, I don't know if this could be adjusted. If not, sure. I'll stay seated. But that was easier. Yeah. I could look at people a little better. <laughs> oh, there we go. Comes right off. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Right. you. If you can tear that tape up. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for that introduction. And I, um, to reiterate, I'm Gail McLaughlin, a former mayor and council member of Richmond, California. I'm also a uh, co-founder of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, what we call the RPA. And um, the RP, well, first of all, let me say, I, uh, like uh, was stated, I served 12 and a half years in office as a corporate free elected official. And I did, was able to make so many accomplishments because I had this organization, the RPA, um, behind me, with me, working together so that we can accomplish um, so many, you know, really a significant transformation of our city. And um, the RPA is an... Um, an organization that came together based on our progressive values, uh, putting party affiliation aside, Greens, Peace and Freedom, party members, um, progressive Democrats, those with no party affiliation, and uh, we, we had had enough. So we came together to become the leaders that we were waiting for. One minute left? One minute. I thought I'd get ten minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Oh, okay. Wait. Okay. Ten minutes for the introduction. <laughs> okay. So, um, so some of the accomplishments um, that we were able to accomplish in Richmond um, are, well, first of all, let me say before RPA, Chevron had control of the whole city council. It, it was a city council purchased by this big oil refinery in our city. It was also known as a high crime city. And so we had some challenges. And over the decade, little over a decade um, that um, RPA has been in existence, we accomplished many things. Um, we accomplished getting a minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. We passed the first new rent control law in California in 30 years. We reduced crime dramatically, a 75% reduction in homicides over the eight years I was mayor. We got many environmental initiatives passed, including being part of a community choice energy program where now our residents get their energy from cleaner and greener sources. Um, we also um, ha were number one in the Bay Area for solar installed per capita. We also got fair taxation from Chevron, $114 million in additional taxes. That's what you can accomplish when you form a progressive alliance working together with corporate free elected officials. <coughs> and today, I want to mention, you know, if one person can't do it, um, you have to put more people in the city council in order to have the votes, right? So we kept electing more and more city corporate free RPA council members. Today, we have five corporate free council seats out of seven on the Richmond City Council. A super majority. So we, we showed it can be done in Richmond, and if it can be done in Richmond under Chevron's money might, it can be done anywhere. So let me segue now into um, this campaign for lieutenant governor and what prompted me. So, so first of all, um, after the RPA, you know, started making all these gains this past November, once we got our super majority, people started asking us, how did you do it in Richmond? How did you get to this point? So we started um, giving presentations. I was uh, a key presenter going city by city. And it became clear that if we ran a statewide race, we have a larger stage. You know, the message um, of how to build 
and encouraging people to build progressive alliances would go much farther. Yeah. So I decided to run for lieutenant governor, a corporate free campaign for lieutenant governor. And this, in essence, is an organizing campaign. I mean, it has two purposes. It's an organizing campaign and it has the electoral um, side of it because I'm running to win. So the organizing side of it is to keep encouraging the development of progressive alliances. You here in um, Santa Clara County have the South Bay Progressive Alliance, one of the first progressive alliances that started uh, emerging you know, after RPA, and congratulations on how, how far you've all come. Um, there are many, there's about six or seven that have emerged uh, beyond that over the past uh, several months. San Diego Progressive Alliance, North Coast, San Francisco, so many. Um, thank you. And so, um, you know, we want to keep doing this, this building of progressive alliances and also um, encouraging the Our Revolution groups. I have, I have the endorsement of 28 Our Revolution groups. That's the group uh, that uh, um, Bernie Sanders launched. So, um, we need to keep doing this building, and if elected, I'll network the Progressive Alliances and the Our Revolution groups together, and we'll have that statewide power to pass single-payer, free college, reforming Prop 13, um, progressive millionaires tax, banning fracking, a public bank, all the things we need. So, let me segue now. That's my campaign. Let's talk about um, the idea of a third party. I know that's the theme here. So, it's my view that we need a de facto party before we start um, building a formalized, official third party. Now, I think the way to get there is by building a corporate-free coalition of people who understand the need to get corporations out of our electoral system, and people that understand the need of working people and that have having an agenda of working people's needs. <coughs> And you know, um, of course we're not going to bow to the corporate-controlled Democratic Party. Uh, the, the corporations are in control of both parties, and they're not going to surrender. They're not going to commit suicide. We have to push them out of our state and push them out of our nation. And that's the, that's the agenda that I'm working on to, to connect people in terms of a corporate-free a democracy and corporate free elected officials. Now, in terms of some people's approach um, to the, you know, feeling a sense of belief in the Democratic Party, there is, there are people that were traumatized by believing in the Democratic Party. And that trauma, you know, continues to this day. So many of them have dropped out and become no party preference. I used to be a Green, I'm a no party preference. I changed to vote for Bernie and stayed uh, no party preference. Now, um, no party preference candidate, um, people, uh, registrants are the largest growing vo voting sector. And that's because people are uncertain. They're not ready to, to embrace a new structure. They're not <laughs> embracing the, you know, the old structures. They need, we need to develop trust before they will embrace, and I'm talking about masses of people, before they will embrace a new party. So for me, I think it's the building of a coalition of corporate free elected officials, of corporate um, free organizations, and uh, people that uh, understand that we have this um, savage capitalism that we live under, and that we need to put the needs of working people on, on the table here and as our agenda. And if we build that, we can start developing trust with people and we can build um, a momentum of people, a coalition, and uh, mobilize that coalition to include Greens, Peace and Freedom, party members, independents, socialists, um, and questioning Democrats. You know, we can come together and with that, we can start to um, create the, uh, the precursor to what will later become um, a truly strong mass party of the people. And to me, that is, um, that is what the 
place we're at right now as, um, as a society. And certainly in California, you know, we have some battles ahead of us. We are the sixth largest economy of the world, and the corporations aren't going to let go of the sixth largest economy in the world very easily. But we can keep pushing. We can get them out of our politics. Um, we can all come together um, at a progressive table, a corporate-free progressive table. And from there, we can decide what deliverables. People need deliverables in order to understand um, that a new structure uh, can happen and can be their new structure that they can be a part of. So if we come together, pick three deliverables, single payer, education, um, you know, banning fracking, um, then we can really begin to educate and make the revolutionary introduction to the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, my name is Nassim Nouri, and I'm going to take this quick opportunity to make a very short announcement. Um, I am a county council for Santa Clara uh, Green Party, and I, uh, we have already announced it earlier today, but our county has been consulting our members and our county council, and we have taken a vote last week to endorse uh, Gail's candidacy. So thank you very much for running. That was my short announcement. And um, I next would like to introduce Eric Reitberg. Uh, who's our next speaker. Actually, Eric is the Green Party candidate for uh, California Secretary of State. Uh, he's the male spokesperson for the Green Party of California. He's also on the coordinating committee of the Green Party of California. He is an indigenous activist, and he actually ran for a delegate in California District 1 for Bernie Sanders. And uh, he later on moved on to be the co-founder of the Green Party of Butte County. Uh, so uh, each of our speakers will have 10 minutes to speak, and after that we will have a uh, time, a uh, two-minute uh, comment and question from all your audience, and you can direct it to our panelists after that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, As the team said, I uh, got involved with politics runner for delegate for Bernie Sanders. Um, I witnessed, you know, what a, how a corporate party operates. Uh, you know, they essentially will not let you in and pull out every stop. And uh, we know for a fact that um, they're a private corporation because of the DNC fraud lawsuit, and they actually don't have a legal obligation to even count their primary votes and can change any rule at any time uh, without even uh, abiding by their own corporate charter. So, like me and many other Bernie Sanders supporters, we made that analysis that if it is, in fact, corporations that are causing this assault on democracy, then we're going to have to make a hard break from those corporations. So I started looking into third parties, and what I found was Jill Stein and Shama Sawant from Socialist Alternative circulating a 150,000 signature petition to get Bernie Sanders to remove himself from this corporate entity and actually take that momentum and bring it into a, a truly corporate-free uh, step of organization that we could then move on to the general election for. Um, unfortunately, I, he did not take that offer and he ended up endorsing Hillary Clinton despite the fact that uh, the establishment you know, cheated him and, and really us. Um, so that, that was a big letdown for me. But I realized that the political revolution that has to happen in this country because we are, in fact, in the state of fascism. Um, just like um, Mussolini, the Italian dictator, said, fascisto, right? When state power merges with corporate power, this is what you get, and we're seeing the effects of it. We have corporate personhood in this country. So uh, democracy, when I, went, when I went and looked through the Green Party's 10 key values, I saw that the number one, number one value that is not only shared by the Green Party of the United States, but it's shared by the largest electoral coalition in the world, which is the 91 international Green Parties, the Global Greens, the number one value is democracy. And in this country, our democracy has been suppressed to a disturbing extent. And the number one cause of that, in my personal opinion, and I'm sure many of you share that, is in fact corporate personhood. The seizing of our very human rights and giving it to an entity that does not sleep, does not die, and is always constantly trying to build and take, take, take capitalism and accumulate that, that power. 
So um, what our organization has been doing is, um, uh, has anybody here heard, heard of Move to Amend? Anybody heard of Move to Amend? <laughs> we so, started one by here six years ago. Yes. So I've really got to hand it to Move to Amend. You know, when the, the Citizens, Un Citizens United ruling came out, um, they started organizing. And one of the co-founders was, in fact, David Cobb, the 2004 Green Party candidate. Um, they said, hey, we can't have this, this co-opting of our very human rights. Um, Citizens United, and it's very frustrating for me, uh, and some people that uh, hear people talk about Citizens United without mentioning corporate personhood, right? Because Citizens United is their free speech. It's money as speech. That's how a corporation can speak. Unlimited money to these campaigns. But if you don't overturn corporate personhood, we're just going to get another some kind of Citizens United, right? We have to take their human rights away from them, right? So I would encourage everybody here to look up Move to Amend, Look up the We the People Amendment, which is a constitutional amendment that actually says only living, human, breathing human beings have human rights. And this will be a major, major step in taking back our democracy. Now, the reason I chose the Green Party is because I saw what it takes to actually create a third party. You have to get ballot access. You have to create a national, uh, a national committee, which is actually very difficult. There is no fast way of going about doing these things. And especially if you don't take corporate money, because then you gotta go do it all, mostly volunteer time and small donations. So it takes, it takes a while. So when I saw the Green Party, and I saw the coalition that was already built between Shama Sawan and Jill Stein, to say, hey, we need a mass party for the 99%, that's when I started looking into it. And when I looked through those platforms, I saw, hey, this is totally in line with my beliefs. I am a socialist. This is green socialism. This is not only acknowledging that the oppression of capitalism is affecting my people, indigenous people, African Americans, it's oppressing women, it's oppressing children, it's oppressing everybody that's not in that 1% where all the money gets funneled to. So I looked at the Green Party and I said, you know, not only do we have to have a mass party for the 99% in this country, but we in fact need a global movement if we want to stop climate change. And that's when I started looking to all these other countries, and I said, hey, the Green Party has the largest coalition ever built electorally. It's those 91 international Green Parties, the Global Greens, and they have a prime minister in Iceland, there's a president in Austria, and I said to myself, if we could get our act together here in this country and take the power back from the corporate state, we have allies all over the world, and we can potentially do something to stop this crisis of climate that will be a disaster for my children, right? So, um, what I'm here saying today is that all of our values are big time, big time in line. At least 90%, I would say, of, of our values are, are aligned. But what we have, um, I'm running for Secretary of State against Alex Padilla. Alex Padilla, he cheated the no party preference people last year big time. There's hundreds of thousands of ballots that still haven't been counted, right? Yeah, right. That's right. So, what I'm saying is we have multiple fantastic candidates that are running for some of the same seats, right? What I would like to see is us come together, especially in this top two system. If everybody knows what top two is, they've made it so we all have to run against these candidates in the primary, and it only allows two people to go to the general, right? One of the great things about a third party is you're usually guaranteed to get to the election, right? Get to the general election. That's especially true of presidential races, and that's the advantage of a third party. Nobody, no, corp no corporatist is going to cut your legs out from underneath you in a primary like they did to Bernie Sanders and make sure you can't get to that general election. So what I would love to see is us take the time to sit down together and say, you know what we need to do? We need to go around the system. We need to have our own independent third party primary system where we all get together, put forward our best candidates. We, we uh, democratically... Uh, vote for them, and the strongest candidate that emerges from, uh, from peace and freedom, from the Green Party, from the Justice Party, from the African People's Socialist Party, the strongest candidate that emerged, let's all unite behind that one person and put the strongest candidate forward to actually take on this corporate duopoly. That's something that I would love to see, and I would love to have those conversations and talk about how we can truly build uh, a coalition that can crack open the duopoly. Because what the Green Party wants to see, we don't want to see like a green dictatorship. We don't want to see everybody be green. We don't want to be the only party. We want a multi-party system, just like all these other countries have.
We want ranked choice voting. We want proportional representation. There is too many voices for a two party. There's only there's only two two party systems in the world. One of them's America. The other one's an island that's about as big as Bakersfield, right? So it's not, it's not enough to cover everybody. So what we would like to see is everybody come together. Use if, if you don't have ballot access in your state, if Socialist Alternative doesn't have ballot access, use the Green Party's ballot access. Bring your candidates in. Let's find the most strongest that we can actually put up against this duopoly so we can crack that system, so we can get in there and put in ranked choice voting, so we can get that proportional representation. And then we can all have what we all truly want, which I believe is a multi-party system to where we can all have our voices heard. And I would appreciate if, you know, start reaching out to all your fellow progressives. We've got way too much in common to allow a corporate party to continue to co-opt every single movement. They've done it so many times. I, I was rooting for Bernie so hard, and I worked so hard on this campaign, but it's not the first time this has happened. It happened with Dennis Kucinich. It happened with Jesse Jackson. They, they use a progressive candidate, and then they give you a corporatist, and they say, well, it's either that or you're going to get a Republican. Even though all the donors that fund our party are the same donors that fund their party, right? So we need to build that alliance. These progressive alliances are fantastic. That is a perfect uh, example of how you can do it on the local level. But I have a three-year-old son, and I know that we have to have a national form of unity between progressives and socialists and people with like-minded ideas that want to save our planet for our children and want to create a true democracy for our children. So please, let's all start talking to each other and see how we can work together to break this stranglehold on our democracy. Thank you. Great. Uh, so next I'm going to introduce uh, Gloria Lariva. And Gloria uh, ran twice for governor of California on the Peace and Freedom ticket in 1994 and 1998, and she was the Peace and Freedom presidential candidate in 2016. Um, she is also a founding member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and is the first vice president of the Pacific Media Workers Guild. Um, and I had I had the great um, opportunity to, to meet her um, Interestingly, in in Havana during one of her one of her many trips to, to Cuba, uh, when she was on the, the U.S. committee to free the, the Cuban Five, and I also uh, had the opportunity to to travel with with her to North Korea on a, on a fact-finding court tour in 2015. So, Gloria. Thank you so much, and I have to say thank you, Susan, for the timekeeping. <laughs> That's very good. Make sure I see the sign. Yeah. Sometimes I, I don't look down. Yeah. Um, everybody, so good to see you here. It's the biggest turnout I've seen in the Peace and Justice Center, and I want to thank the San Jose Peace and Justice Center for being a, really a great mobilizing center for so long in this city. It's very, very important. And. Um, I think that it's, it is a very interesting time, as uh, Shadat said, in this last year, this enormous crisis brought on by the election of Trump. And yet, when you think about what the alternative would have been, as, as horrifying as it is what he has done with all the reversal of many uh, progressive things that have taken place, um, the dismantling of the EPA, and so on and so on, I won't go into that, we know what it is. Um, Hillary Clinton was a great advocate and pushed so hard for war, and was successful under the Obama administration of destroying Libya. And we're still seeing the result of that war, of the destruction of a progressive government in which women had equal rights which was a revolutionary struggle in 1969. For those of us who are old enough, we remember Wheelis Air Force Base. It was the largest U.S. Air Force Base in the world, you know, ruling over North Africa and against the whole Mediterranean. But uh, King Idris was overthrown in 1969, and uh, Gaddafi and the party he led 
undertook a massive reorganization of that society because of the control of their oil resources and their water resources too. And now you don't see it in the news because the war is over. The U.S. defeated that government. But now there is slavery, wholesale slavery and sale of African people. But you don't hear about it. You don't hear about this enormous destruction of Iraq. I went to Iraq three times in the 1990s during the U.S. genocidal blockade of that country. I made a documentary about it. And you could go through the hospitals and see hundreds of children, mothers and fathers, dying because of the U.S. total blockade of Iraq. But you don't see anything about that. All you hear is how fratricidal the society is there and how people just can't get along um, when in fact that wasn't the case before the U.S. invasion in 2003. And I say all this about the international issue, including that of Palestine and Trump's move of, um, or de declaration that the U.S. Embassy will move to Jerusalem and that they will recognize Jerusalem as a capital. I mention the international situation because it has everything to do with California politics. Wasn't it Governor Brown? who decided that BDS was going to be virtually illegal in the state in terms of contracting and uh, trying to weaken this great movement that is so necessary for the survival and for the Palestinian people and their right to self-determination. It was a dangerous move on his part, but that's California politics or all the taxes that are paid to back up the U.S. military uh, and all the U.S. aggression around the world. So, part of my message as gubernatorial candidate will be uh, not only that we have to fight for reforms and fight for the things that people need uh, for $15 an hour immediately, but I believe that it should be $20 an hour minimum wage in California. You can't live on $20 an hour in San Francisco or San Jose or Los Angeles or so many other cities. Very little remains where you can live on $20 an hour. And, uh, but the message I have, in addition to things like uh, demanding and fighting for the overturning of the Costa Hawkins uh, law in the state that bans uh, rent control for any buildings oh, newer than 1983, or for the overturning and elimination of the Ellis Act, which has led to thousands of evictions statewide, tens of thousands of evictions, because it allows a landlord to just declare that they'll no longer be a landlord for a certain building and evict everyone, no matter how long they've been there, no matter how old they are, no matter what other protections they used to have. These are the things that have to do with the state and why I'm running. But in addition to reforms and fighting for the things we've lost, for the things that we still need, um, the message is also that it's really only socialism that can resolve the problems for the working class and for all humanity. It's only by ending the capitalist system of overproduction that we know is destroying the earth, whether the oceans or the land or the air or the water, that is capitalism, the unrelenting production and competition between all the corporations, including the military, uh, production of nuclear weapons that the U.S. is responsible for. And it's this last year with Bernie Sanders especially, opening this idea for people, millions of people across the country, about socialism being a legitimate um, policy or program for people to promote. He, he is the most prominent socialist, even though um, I would have differences with his view about socialism, <laughs> is that I also think that the people are quite capable of supporting and understanding socialism, which is really in their interest when you explain some simple facts. Look at all of us here today, and look at everything that you consume, whether it's the clothes you wear. I know if you look at your label, you'll see it was made in some other country, very rarely in the U.S. Everything we make Every, everything we wear or eat is produced by thousands and thousands of people in social production. Even a t-shirt, from the planting of the cotton, to the picking of it, to the harvesting, the producing cloth, everything that we use and consume in modern society is not done by any handicraft very rarely. And therefore, as the social production grows and grows, 
and tens of thousands of more people are brought into the production of any product in the world, the ownership becomes more and more private, more and more in the hands of less and less people. That's why six individuals own the wealth of half the world's population. And it's getting worse. When you have the new tax plan of the Republicans, that the Democrats were just too busy uh, focusing on Russia. This false myth about Russia being the reason why they lost. They lost because they don't represent the working class. Yeah. They don't represent the poor. They talk about the middle class as if uh, everybody else who's be be beneath the so-called middle class uh, level of standard of living doesn't really count. And even the middle class can't make it anymore. Try sending your kids to college because you're not entitled to aid. You have to go into debt and give up your retirement so your kids can have an education. And now the youth of this country have close to $1.5 trillion in debt. That's why part of my program calls for the cancellation of all student debt. Is it ridiculous? Yes. No. Why? Because we just gave $800 billion to the banks. They didn't have to answer for any of that money, what they did to it. They just amassed more wealth. They um, evicted more people. Including, who's that man, the Treasury Secretary? I still remember Mnuchin. 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 Well, he is responsible for the eviction of more than 30,000 people. So, if you talk to people about the fact that all wealth is created by us, by the working class, nationally and internationally, and you say, the bosses aren't needed, the owners aren't needed, because we can run everything, we run society, we just don't own it. We just don't have control of it. That's what socialism is. And I think that it's utterly necessary to take this message across and to fight for it. I agree that we need reform in elections, but it's getting less and less democratic. It's becoming more anti-democratic. And we have more Supreme Court decisions coming down the line to deny women the right to abortion, to deny workers the right to a union, to deny uh, us the right to uh, democratic elections, which I don't know when they ever existed. And I'll say one more thing about the elections. In this race, and the races that we've run before in Peace and Freedom, we call for the rights of the undocumented to vote. We call for full rights for the undocumented, for all immigrants. We call, and we call for the rights of all those people who've been in fran disenfranchised, including the fact, in this country, by the way, there are about 35 million people, adult people, who are not allowed to vote because they're ex-prisoner and live in states where they're not allowed to, because they're the 17 million permanent residents. We talk about the undocumented, but the permanent residents are 17 million. They don't have the right to vote. That's more than 10% of the population. Um, my talk is over. <laughs> Nick Brenya. <laughs> okay, Nick uh, is currently serving as a founder of the Movement for People's Party. Uh, the organization is dedicated to building a coalition for a nationally viable progressive party. In 2015, Nick joined Bernie's presidential campaign as its um, national political outreach coordinator where he actually uh, lobbied elected officials and DNC superdelegates on the senator's behalf. Uh, after the campaign, he became a founding member of Our Revolution and its first uh, electoral manager. And in 2017, he became the founder and national director of Draft Bernie for People's Party. Welcome, Nick. And since then, we have uh, become the movement for People's Party uh, just as of uh, a month ago. Uh, it's so great to, to be here in front of uh, all of you to see this turnout, to be here with these, with these great candidates who are taking it to the two-party system. Um, at Movement for a People's Party, uh, like you started to say, what our mission is, you know, as an evolution of drafting Bernie from a people's, for a People's Party, is the idea that at this point where we are 
uh, as more and more people are beginning to realize now uh, a large majority of Americans, it's 61% uh, of Americans who are calling for a major new party, 71% of millennials. These are record numbers. These are taken by Gallup, these polls, in fact. Uh, and, the, and the questions, when you, actually, when you actually read the questions of the polls, they were written in a way, and the methodology is constructed in a way so as to suppress the number of people who are saying it. So, it, it is truly remarkable that that many people are saying, are coming to this conclusion now. Uh, and when we switched over from draft burning to the movement for People's Party, we held a conference in Washington, D.C., the Convergence Conference, uh, and we gathered about 400 uh, progressives from across the country, including uh, dozens of, of uh, progressive luminaries like um, Shama Sawant, Cornel West, uh, Jimmy Dore, and we talked about what is it going to take to really break through the system that we have now. We arrived at three points of agreement, and so there's multiple different organizations here speaking. You know, it was us, it was Green Party, Socialist Alternative, many different groups, and we said, you know, where, what is what is the foundation upon which we can build something, a collective uh, people's party that can actually overthrow a major party? Because the United States is a two-party system. And the way that a new party comes about takes power is by replacing an establishment party. Uh, and we arrived at three points of agreement. Uh, the first was that in order to achieve our progressive vision, we need a party that actually stands for it. That's simple enough. That actually represents it. But it needs to be said. Because the Democratic Party and the Republican Party do not. They do not. They're, the foundation for designing their platforms is not what's in the best interest of the people. It's what's in the best interest of the donors. And in any new party, the don which, which leads to the second point of agreement. And that was that the new party that any kind of mass-based coalition party of many organizations must be completely free of corporate money. Because if they're, a party will represent its donor base. And if the donor base is separate and distinct from the voters, and is separate and distinct from the citizens, then it will represent the donors instead of the citizens. And that's the dynamic that you see in the Democratic and the Republican Party. So it is essential that in any new party, if it is to represent working people, that, it, that those two be the same, that the donors be the same as, uh, as the actual people who are voting. And the third point of agreement that we had is that none of our organizations could achieve it alone. None of our organizations... Uh, this kind of system that has existed, this dynamic of siloed progressive organizations, uh, organizations that kind of uh, remain within their particular issue area, organizing with maybe a small group of orga organizations that share that, that similar, uh, that also work in that area, uh, but for the large part not communicating with each other, not working collaboratively. And that that was actually uh, a dynamic that the establishment and that the system tolerated because it's ineffective. And that it, what it was going to take to actually put together a coalition that could start a mass-based working class party in the United States, a nationally viable party, was to break through that dynamic and to create a party that instead brings together these folks to the table for its formation from the onset. And that is the mission that we embarked on uh, as our evolution into movement for a People's Party. You can imagine now, so in, in, the, in, in, in what I've been doing for the past year organizing for this, I've had the privilege of speaking uh, to people in all kinds of different parts of society. So speaking to labor leaders, speaking to uh, Sanders surrogates, uh, speaking to uh, people who are the leaders of social movements, um, and seeing really that there is 
great agreement. You know, there's people over here, there's people over there, there's people over there. There's people all over the place that reflect those statistics that I mentioned at, at the onset uh, that believe, yeah, you know, I think it's, it's time and we need a, a major new mass space party to uh, But the problem is those people aren't speaking to each other. They're not connected. They're, they are in those silos. And so the challenge that we have given ourselves as an organization and that I think that we have as a movement is to really facilitate that conversation, is to bring all of those people together. Because collectively, as a left, we, we have the resources, we have the numbers, and we have the public support to overthrow these two corporate parties. It's, I'm sure most of you have heard this, but it, it, it's, uh, it's worth saying. There's, Support for single payers is about two to one. Support for free public, free public college, about two to one. Support for getting money out of politics, higher than 90%. When do you get agreement on anything in politics of that level? So there, it, there exists the foundation, you know, and, and that, is, that goes down the line of the issues that Bernie Sanders ran on. And that, actually, that explains how he went from 3% name recognition, no money, an anointed opposition candidate, uh, the entire establishment media against him, the entire party establishment against him, all of that, how he went from that to success uh, in the first place. And that's the case that we're making now, is that frustration with the existing two-party system has reached, has crossed a threshold where people are prepared to support something different on the national level even, and to think, uh, to, to think boldly, in the way that they did with Bernie. You think of how much time people invested into Bernie's campaign when every traditional organ of the media and, and establishment politics was telling you that it couldn't be done. So he had none of that. He didn't have the money, the media, the party support, none of those things that traditionally determine who's successful in politics. So that tells you there's something different. There's another force out there in politics that is actually more powerful than all of these things combined. And that's his message. It's his message that resonates with 60%, 90% of Americans down each of these issues. And it's that desire for a contest against both establishment parties. When Bernie was out there challenging the two establishment parties during the primaries, he was bringing Thousands, tens of thousands of people, without fail, wherever he went across the country. I remember <laughs> being on the campaign. We announced some of the rallies that we were going to have hours before that we were actually going to have them. I remember we announced there was one that, that was hilarious. We we announced it at 11 p.m. The rally was at 10 10 a.m. The next morning, thousands of people there overnight. You know, over and yet with so and. Yet, when it came time for Bernie to, uh, when, it, when the primary ended, Bernie had to make a decision about whether he was going to stick with the Democratic Party, what he was going to do with all of this energy and momentum that he had built up to this crescendo, uh, or whether he was going to really go independent. Bernie decided to endorse Hillary. Well, Bernie spent the next few months campaigning for Hillary. He went to events, and... There would be 100, 150 people that would show up to his events. And so it showed that it really wasn't about Bernie. It was about the issues. It was about what he stood for. When somebody, Bernie was just a manifestation of what people wanted. And he gave it a voice and he channeled it. But what people really wanted was that revolution against the political establishment. And that's what we have the opportunity to build here as a whole. But none of us is going to do it alone. If we can, however, put together the coalition of unions, working people, communities of color, you know, Sanders surrogates and, and, and staffers, there's more reaching out to me now. They're telling me, all right, I'm done, I've had it. You know, how do I, how do I sign up? There, there's even uh, members of Democratic uh, state central committees reaching out to us and telling us, we will leave the Democratic State Central Committee, and participate in the founding of a new party. That's amazing. Because the last thing that I'll say is that when the 
in, in looking at, back at our own history, at how it was that a, uh, that a third party actually replaced a major party, uh, that the Republican Party replaced the Whig Party, what happened there is that it was a split inside the existing Whig Party. It was over its, uh, its uh, refusal to support um, abolition. And there had been existing parties that had been abolitionists before that uh, for many years who were pushing for that. But what it actually took was a new party that came about that was a divide that actually broke the Whig Party in half and took a whole bunch of the leadership over to a new party to found it. And that's what we have the opportunity to do now. That's what those state central committee members represent. That's what those party leaders who are speaking to us represent, is that they're saying we're ready to do that kind of thing today, along with all of those other coalition members. But I think that's our challenge now, and I'll turn it over to the discussion. Please, and they will have two minutes to answer. Yes, safe. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, I was, I mean, that was a brilliant panel, so thank you all. Um, I was left a little bit uncomfortable because some of you may know that I'm the campaign manager for Josh here, who's also running for governor. Gloria, I agreed with 200% of what you said. And <laughs> I'm just standing here thinking. I wish I could give her my second preference vote, because that would be really straightforward. I've lived in countries where you can do that, and you can't here. <laughs> so I was wondering if one possibility would be to explore, um, as we move forward, as we build alliances, one of our first steps could be to get a ballot measure for ranked choice voting, so that I could, in fact, give you my second preference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any comments to that? Kudos, everybody's up to that. All right. <laughs> yeah, so that would be very good. But, um, I wanted to ask, what party are you representing, or just independent? Green Party. Oh, Green Party, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I want to introduce another candidate here from Peace and Freedom Party, who is also our state chair. Kevin Aiken, please stand Kevin. <laughs> State treasurer, and if you can, then we have flyers outside. Sweet man. <laughs> Socialist solutions. That's right. That work. We know they work. Thank you. Okay, I, and to, to Gloria's point, please make sure that you do take some literature on the table outside, right as you enter from the front entrance. There's stacks of literature that our uh, esteemed panelists have brought representing their organizations. Okay, next question. Comments, please, Warner. Um, my my uh, my name's Warner Bloomberg. I've been a Green since 1994. Before that, I was registered Democrat. And when I first came to California in 1976, I registered Peace and Freedom Party. Um, and before that, I was involved with something called Independent Voters of Illinois, um, which was a non-party organization that supported candidates um, that essentially were known as reform candidates in the 1970s. Um, so I want to suggest that one, political parties do not run candidates. Candidates ultimately are self-selecting and decide to run and in fact have a major responsibility for uh, running and being successful or unsuccessful in their own campaigns. So I'm, I want to ask for comments about the idea of not necessarily working towards forming a new political party, but forming perhaps a statewide, and perhaps as was suggested here, uh, nationally even, uh, an organization along the lines of the progressive alliances, uh, such was formed as was formed in, in Richmond. So I, I'd be interested in hearing comments from the panel. So I'll come and thank you for uh, that question. 
Um, I absolutely agree that that's what we need, coalitions and alliances before we, need, before we get to that official party um, effort. Um, now, what I'm doing in, in terms of my approach to California, and I think if we can have statewide political power as a alliance, as a network of local progressive alliances, we can have that kind of statewide, progressive, corporate-free power in California, and that will send a message to other states and to the nation as a whole. So to me, it's all about building from the grassroots and connect, and people get involved. People have to be activated, and they get involved when there are issues in their own community. So building these local progressive alliances, networking them together, um, building that statewide power and having one state take the lead and uh, influencing the nation as a whole, in my view, has a lot of um, influence and a lot of feasibility. I say California can do it and, um, you know, at the same time, I think we can, we can start coming together, those of us who think outside the um, two-party system, but we have to understand that people need to um, trust us, and the only way they're going to trust us is if they see deliverables, if they see successes. That's why the success of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, the success of other alliances has so much um, value because it breaks through people's distrust about nothing is ever going to change. So once we, we get more successes, while we build this national coalition or alliance, whatever you want to call it, I think we're going to fi uh, find ourselves um, having the trust of the people, and from there, a party will be the next step. Can I, can I respond? Go ahead. Oh. Oh. Sure. Oh, you okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree that we have to have uh, an alliance. You just absolutely have to. If you look at the voter registration statistics, there's 43% independents. And there's, uh, you know, there's two minority parties. And the Bernie wing is a minority of a minority party, right? Mm -hmm. There's more of us on the outside than there is on the inside. But we got to figure out how to work together. Uh, and I would use example is the main green independent party. They hyphenated their name because they knew that they had ranked choice voting, mm -hmm. right? And they knew that they could bring in a bunch of people with like-minded uh, values and that they, could, they have the structure to primary each other they have the structure to decide who's the strongest candidate and how they can unify everybody behind that one candidate. And now they have, you know, two state legislators. They have Andrew John Baird for the Maliseet trend. And um, so they're setting the example. I always thought with cannabis that California was going to be the pioneer, right? But unfortunately, we've got way too many corporate candidates in charge of the state. So it's, taken, it's been, you know, Oregon and Washington and Colorado, right? And so as much as I would love and I'm going to try everything I can to make California be that state to set the example. Um, it might be state, a state like Maine that we never expected, right? But we need to figure out, and, and so it's just a matter of getting everybody at the table and coming up with a way of doing it. Because in, in my view, which is the national view, yes, we have to build grassroots, but we have to plan that national organization well ahead of time. Because I watched what happened when thousands of Bernie Sanders tried to join the Green Party and they hadn't even considered that happening. Like we couldn't absorb all that, right? So we're going in our bylaws right now and we're gonna create a situation to where it's an open door and that we have a way of processing um, you know, the best potential socialist progressive candidate. And that's very much what I would like to see. Thank you. Go ahead, Josh. Sure. Thanks, Christine. So, Gail and Nick, I noticed that you both um, put forward this idea of a de facto corporate-free party, which I, I think personally is going to there'll be a corporate party and a corporate-free party in the not too distant future, maybe six years, maybe four years. I think that's how this is going to play out. But what I wonder about is, so I understand, you know, they have a different parties that exist right now, and that if a person, a candidate was corporate free, then you could include them in this de facto thing that you've started, right? 
But how do you deal with Democrats who are, say they're corporate free, but then they get? I was a party leader of the Democratic, you know, I was the Democratic Party leader for a little while, three months. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Bernie campaign, invaded with the Bernie campaign, couldn't, couldn't hack their, uh, their cheating. But um, and, but I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned was when I would sit, I went on purpose to all these meetings, and I, I looked at their um, fundraising, right? And, you know, we won uh, in Yolo County with $5,000 for Bernie in the primary. The Yolo County Democratic Party threw $130,000 at it and lost. So I know we can win. I know that by speaking for the people, with the people, we can win, right? The corporate free people. But they funnel their money to the candidates through the party as well. So how do we deal with that? If there's a, uh, you know, Brock Monty, let's say, running for governor, corporate free, but the party is funneling money underneath. So how do we deal with that? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> I'll repeat the question. Uh, um, and so, sorry, what was your name? Josh Jones. Josh. Josh was asking. Uh, right. Josh was asking, how is it that we deal with uh, candidates who say that they're corporate free inside the Democratic Party, yet are receiving money through the DNC, uh, which you know, and it's essentially money that's being donated to corporations. Um, and I would say that that is at the heart of why a new party must be the solution, or why an independent party must be the solution, is because uh, some people have this view, they go forward with this view of the Democratic Party and the Republican parties as empty shells. You know, and they say, oh, it's just a shell, you can come and take it over, you know, whoever's in it determines its character. That's not true. It's not true. Yeah. Uh, and what it, what it really is, is, is a structure that's designed to prevent that kind of thing. It's designed to prevent being taken over. Um, so, for example, uh, in February, the DNC had its leadership elections. Were the members whatsoever involved in that? No. It was just, who was it electing the leaders? It was the superdelegates, the DNC members, the people I had the pleasure of loving on the Bernie campaign. You know, unsurprisingly, they picked the establishment candidate, despite the fact that Keith Ellison, uh, the, the Sanders wing representative, um, had at that point done many things to make himself palatable to them. Uh, for example, endorsing a billionaire in Florida for a state party leader position, uh, reneging on his <laughs> promise to uh, to stop taking corporate money at the DNC, um, you know, and so he did, and 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 so that's the whole that's the point. Is it did Keith Ellison do those things because he believes them? No, no, he doesn't. He doesn't believe that. I I had the pleasure of working with him. You know, he doesn't believe that. He did it because it's a structure and it's a machine that forces you to do that. And it for and it uh, on I, in one of my interviews with Jimmy Dore, I challenged him to tell me to name one person who's gone to the Democratic Party and come out further left. <laughs> it doesn't happen because it's it's a structure. The structure is the problem. We're not missing honest enough politicians. It's a structure as a whole. That's why it has to be outright. Replaced. I would like to answer it. Oh, let, let me come in and then you get as well, if that's okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you mentioned me, Josh. Um, the, what I'm calling for is a united front of um, corporate free individuals, corporate free candidates, corporate free elected officials. Um, it's true that the corporate free Democrats are um, getting some money, but the corporate free Democrats are not going to be getting much money from the Democratic Party. It's the <laughs> corporate Democrats that are going to get the money from the Democratic Party. It's, it's this battle of the, um, within the Democratic Party, and it's the Berniecrats that are really pushing um, for, yes, they believe they can take over the party. We have to reach people where they're at. And so we need these people who believe that the Democratic Party can be reformed. We need them to come to our side. We need to bring them, if they have that corporate free sensibility, we need to bring them to the table. So I'm saying a united front of cor people who understand that corporations need to be out of our electoral process and 
from there, we will strategize and we will work through how we get to that place of a new party. I mean, people come to understanding the need for change in different ways. I mean, yeah. people come to the Green Party from, you know, their sense of experience in one way. Other people come to peace and freedom. Others are just in this uncertain place and they become NPPs because they don't um, want to trust, they don't trust any party. So I think we need to embrace people who are getting it that, um, that corporations need to be out of our politics. And that is going to, that is the winning issue to me, getting, pol getting corporate corporations out of our politics. And if, if we have a coalition, a united front, that, um, where people understand that concept, and then we start bringing forward um, other concepts, some, just a few deliverables or something, success breaks through people's distrust. When they see that ca candidates can't be bought, when they see that um, organizations stand apart from corporations, they're going to make. They're going to be more um, open to a party, and I think we need a huge amount of people. We don't just need leftists that are already got that sensibility in their minds. Sorry, Gloria. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think I I have a, a different view about the issue of what comes first, and I think that the. Um, if we look at the very near past, but it, it also even from the time of like the 30s, it's the social movements that drive any kind of change in politics. And I think uh, while the individuals here, myself and, and ourselves in Peace and Freedom Party, are working, uh, fighting for any kind of possible uh, reform in the, in the electoral process, it's becoming more anti-democratic, and that's really the trend. We could elect, let's say that we could elect a few anti-corporate members of Congress, what do you have? You have like the full <laughs> power structure. The U.S. elections are designed to keep the capitalists in power. Yep. And when you challenge it and you get closer, they find a way to shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. I worked on uh, successfully in 1988 in getting um, a Socialist Party on the ballot there through a federal lawsuit. and. The legislature just changed a law and kicked everybody off the ballot that was a minor party. Yeah. I mean, we see a thousand examples of it. The the um, so so I think that we have to recognize that while we work on elections and run for any elections, the key is also uh, the parties being involved in social movements. Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, you know, to help to help. Uh, promote those and be part of the struggle. And we're, I don't think that the whole left and progressive people are going to be able to change things by being involved in it, but we need to help provide program, show solidarity, be with the struggle of the people. And I want to say one thing. I think it's great that $15 an hour got passed in Richmond, but it first came from the low-wage workers. And that's not to say that that work wasn't important. But a few years ago, we would say $15 an hour, and people go like, that's, okay, you can say that, but that's kind of ridiculous. And it was the, the, the McDonald's workers, the Walmart, and the unions, SEIU and others, that made it a reality and forced a lot of cities to go, okay, we'll give you $15, but like in five years? And they did it to, they co-opted it. The Democrats, by the way, are the great co-opter of many social media. And anyone with an illusion will be swallowed up and disappear. Um, th today, Trump signed the $700 billion defense, quote-unquote, authorization act. Uh, and the total war budget, actually, in this country, as most people here know, is close to $1 trillion a year. Um, so to me, uh, any movement that we put together, or we have already put together, uh, opposition to war, to imperialism, to war spending, has to be at the heart of it, because all of the things that were mentioned, free college, you know, free health, you know, low cost or free health care for all, none of those things are going to happen while this country is spending $1 trillion a year on war. Uh, and that's why I think the, the movements, the parties that we put together to challenge the Democrats and the Republicans have to have that at the center. And I'd like to, I'd love to hear uh, sort of comments uh, from the different people on that subject. So, 100%, uh, right? 
Um, this, 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 no. Repeat the question. The question is, if we're going to form a new party, uh, we have to have um, a strict analysis on anti-war, right? So the question is, do we have that analysis, right? I would probably say all of us have that analysis. The Green Party of the United States has the Green New Deal, right? And if you've never read the Green New Deal, a lot of people just think, oh, green, green energy, solar panels, wind farms. Yeah, of course, solar panels and wind farms, right? But if you've actually read it, there's four pillars, and it's economic. It's an economic bill of rights, right? It's twenty. It's twenty. It's fifteen dollars an hour, a minimum wage, and up at the very least, right? Fifteen dollars an hour, minimum wage, right? It is yes, a green transition, the second pillar, and um, and most importantly is. To me, as running for Secretary of State, is the fourth pillar, which is the functioning democracy, right? And we cannot have a functioning democracy, democracy with a corporate person and such. But in that pillar, you'll see that we call, what's already pinned out, we call for a 50% reduction in military spending, right? And now, there's lots of uh, conservatives out there that are going to be like, oh my god, oh my god, 50%, right? We're talking about 2001. Prior to these regime change wars, we were still spending more military than any other country in the world. But by simply cutting that military spending by 50%, we would stop the regime change wars, and we would have a budget enough so to give us health care for all, to give us uh, free college tuition, right? And to do something about housing for uh, people that are de in this country. It's insane, right? But beyond taxes, right, and beyond uh, cutting the spending, which all of that needs to happen, the rich need to pay their fair share, and they, uh, we need the Eisenhower tax, to be honest. And he was a Republican, 90% corporate tax rate, it's time for you to pay your share, right? So, but we are a monetarily sovereign country, if we can spend $600 million for war, we can spend whatever, we can print it whenever, and we can move to a green transition and stop these wars immediately. So, please read the Green New Deal. So, I'll, I'll quickly say, yes, you know, and uh, of course we have to always uh, push uh, that whole war thinking back. And uh, as mayor, um, I always took the local to the global. You know, we always talked about why we are getting the uh, money from the feds that we should be getting because the money's going to war. And you can continuously do that. You can draw the links um, from the local level to the global, and you must. And um, I, I do want to mention, of course, Gloria, you know, the, the low-income wage workers were the ones oh, that yeah. organized. Absolutely. Social movements are key. And they are not distinct from local political organizing. They are not distinct from progressive alliances. You bring the social movements in to the local organizing. You bring the social movements into the networking between uh, progressive alliances, and you bring them into a national coalition. So, um, and you bring out the issue of war and how we have to stop that. And, and you work with the corporate free elected officials to bring those resolutions to the city council to say we have to end this war, that war, all wars. It makes a difference. We have to think big. We have to think large numbers of people. And that's the way we're going to educate the public and they're going to be ready to embrace us and we have to have the successes. And the successes will show people that it can be done. I mean, People want action. They don't want just theory. They don't want just ideas. Yeah. We have to show it can be done. Uh, oh, I'm sorry about the issue of war. I like that question. And uh, I believe that all U.S. bases abroad, the more than 700 and others that we don't know about, should be shut down immediately, including the bases and occupation of South Korea, uh, Japan, dozens of bases in Japan, but all over the world, and all sanctions is punishing people uh, for trying to take an independent road, whether it's Cuba, Venezuela, or Korea. And I don't know if people know, right now there's U.S. war maneuvers going on against Korea. The U.S. is planning war, and I believe North Korea has a right to build nuclear weapons as a deterrent. It is a deterrent for them. And I've been to the North twice, I've been to the South also. And it's a country that should be reunited. 
um, on a peaceful basis. And uh, if anybody wants to know about North Korea, just ask me. <laughs> anyway, after the program. But, I, but absolutely, including uh, opposing what the U.S. has done to Syria. All the, all the terrorism, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, you know, Al ISIS, it's the fertile ground that the U.S. created by destroying Iraq, destroying Iraq, and trying to destroy Syria, and creating huge destruction there. Afghanistan, we can talk all night. <laughs> I'd like to get into a couple of nuts and bolts. Why don't you turn around, Kevin? No, turn around. Turn around, turn around face the audience. Yeah, I, I'd like to get into a couple of nuts and bolts things that explain why parties do certain things at certain times, why parties on the left do certain things at certain times, even if you might not think they make sense. Sometimes they're reacting to the structure of state laws. But first, I just want to mention that we also have a candidate for attorney general uh, Adrian uh, Bracciali uh, of uh, Redlands in San Bernardino County. She's a defense attorney. Uh, she worked as a uh, public defender for a while, and she's trying to build her independent practice as a defense attorney. And boy, is she hot on the crookedness, the twistedness of our so-called justice system. So you'll be hearing from her. But one nut and bolt thing is candidates need money for certain specific things. They need money for filing fees because the lower uh, in lieu signature requirements for third party candidates were eliminated a few years ago uh, as part of the aftermath of the top uh, two um, thing. And um, it's impossible to get enough signatures to uh, meet the the in lieu requirements for filing fees, so it's necessary to raise some money for that. Another is those nice statements in the ballot that you look at, in the ballot pamphlet that you look at before the election, mm -hmm. they cost $25 a word. $25 a word, you need thousands of dollars. And we need, give, give each of these candidates a $25 check, okay? <laughs> By one word. <laughs> Uh, and in the primary election, for a party to be safe from being dumped off if its registration falls or other people's registrations go up, they need to get all of their all of the candidates of that party for a particular statewide office need to get two percent of the vote. So it's really important to vote for third party candidates just to keep them on the ballot. Yeah.
like uh, like Kevin was saying, you know, you need to take into consideration how we need to help build these third parties because we need to have maintain our ballot access, right? So I would look to uh, people of wisdom that you know have accomplished great things like what what Gail has done, and uh, look to some of the endorsements that she's given. But then think about um, think about the parties and the values that are out there, like Peace and Freedom Party, and understand that you know. We need, we need your help. We need your help in this time of restructuring, really, where progressives really, really, really want a new third party. We need everything we can to stay alive and make it through this election so that we can come together, put something together to where, yes, there will be in the future uh, a ballot line of progressives where we've all come together and put together the strongest people we possibly can. And that's what we have to do. We, we cannot remain divided. Fascism is not going to allow us to remain divided. Uh, this has happened before in the Russian Revolution. It happened before in Nazi Germany. Uh, the left couldn't get their act together, and fascism took over. And look what happened there, right? We cannot fail. We cannot fail at this. We have to unite, and we have to do this as soon as possible. Um, I agree. Uh, okay. <laughs> I agree with um, Eric about the issue of there's not much time. This is a very limited uh, period, and unfortunately because of Prop 14 and the top two, just about everyone's going to get knocked off the ballot in June. But, uh, you know, we were on the ballot for governor in 1994 and 98, and we're not going to be this time, uh, to, to provide this, a program and, and ideas for people, which was, they were so excited with Sanders. So, for Peace and Freedom Party, we're the only socialist party on the ballot in California and across the country. It's, for us, it's very, very critical that a socialist party remain on the ballot. And so our work is, frankly, related to getting the petitions, as um, Kevin was talking about. And we're going to do a very energetic, volunteer, statewide, just going everywhere. We've done it before, and we were excited in the presidential campaign. Um, I received more votes than any socialist in 40 years, including in California. And we're going to do that. The energy, we have plenty of uh, great young people who've joined uh, Peace and Freedom Party in the last year. The way that the movement has risen up, because of Sanders, because of Occupy, and all the things that have taken place, Black Lives Matter, and so on. So I, I, I think that's where we're really at. And I've got to say, and I've run for office a few times, and I've always thought it was important that there be more than one progressive candidate. We're not in competition with each other. The more that the public says, wow, she's not the only one who says that, and somebody else agreed with her or him, that is very important. I think coalition uh, is, is vital in every way, but we can also have our independent stance on, on many issues. And we also reach, like it's a, it's a quilt of, of reaching more and more people. Thank you. Uh, Eric brought up and this um, the electoral cycles uh, we need to build uh, we need to start looking past and thinking past two year intervals you know it's for for so long the movement has been thinking um, in terms of the two year electoral cycles and what we've been doing is we've been putting all of our energy kind of into these can into campaigns. Uh, which amount to, in a lot of ways, pop-up organizations, especially inside the Democratic Party. You build them up. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of volunteering that goes on into that. There's a lot of fundraising that goes on into it. But when it ends, there's very little to show for it. And so, whereas that energy could have been spent instead building an alternative. And so, I think that's, you know, what we need to be devoting our energy towards now is building that long-term alternative. We also need to recognize that, of course, right now, we don't, uh, we don't in, in, in the existing progressive third parties, we don't have the numbers to create, you know, even combined, adding us up, we don't have the numbers to create something that, uh, that would, you know, be greater than the Democratic Party or Republican Party. Uh, but, but we need to, Parties, because again, that's not enough, but social movements, that they have actually added up to more than the sum of their parts. Uh, and they have had an appeal that was greater 
than any particular one on their own. And a lot of that has to do with creating a center of gravity. And so in general, how we as Movement for a People's Party view kind of the independent uh, progressive landscape is that there are, we have a problem of economies of scale. You know, is there are thousands of organizations out there, uh, but that they're not collaborating. And the question, as we've been talking about, the mission is to bring enough of them together that you create a center of gravity that can start to roll away, that can start to snowball, can start to gain more and more people. The last thing I'll say is that uh, for a long time, we haven't had, we have, I think we have to embrace a kind of political imagination that we haven't had before. And we have to be willing to think that we have opportunities that we didn't have in the past, given the level of support, given the Bernie Sanders campaign, now given the level of support for third parties. And that there, there is great risk of not acting too. It's not just an opportunity, but it is potentially a great risk because the electoral vacuum of non-representation has grown so large that it fuels the rise of demagogues like Trump. We saw what happened in 2016 when the right wing was the only anti-establishment alternative. We saw what happened to Trump won. And we face that now on an even higher scale with greater stakes, and that is that if we cannot come together to offer a populist progressive alternative to the American people, the working people, that the billionaires and the elites will do essentially what they did in France, which is they will run the existing establishment parties into the ground, and once they realize that there is going to be an electoral break away from them, they will switch strategies, and they will create a third party of their own, which is another neoliberal party, which is intended to hijack the revolution. Thank you, Nick. Thank We're going to try to get a few Can more. Can I just say oh, one thing about this, uh, what Eric uh, has said? Um, I have endorsed a lot of corporate free candidates. Um, you can check out my website. And let me tell you that there are multiple corporate free candidates running for various offices, and they're all and these corporate free candidates are all good candidates. And so, you know, I support this this conversation with all of these candidates who are putting out this good message. Thank you. A really quick point that, uh, thank you Gloria for mentioning, uh, Stop Top 2 is the campaign that actually requires Californians to collect 800,000, that's all, 800,000 signatures and we can stop Top 2 in 2018. So get ready when you go collecting signatures for these folks. Okay, so we have five people on staff, please, you are next, introduce yourselves. Um, my name is Baba Kofi. Um, my question is more about timing. Um, um, we talked about how we might be able to get to a place where we uh, put together the coalition in the next two to six years, but we're looking at only about a couple of years before we have failed to solve the climate change problem uh, to the point where we're becoming a, a, a uh, soon to be extinct species. Uh, and we could get new time. So, uh, what's the way to, to shorten this, the time span to getting to where we want to be? Um, we really can't wait more than a couple of years. Um, uh, waiting until even um, <clears throat> the, the next even numbered year is, uh, is a very risky uh, prospect. If possible, if you could keep your uh, yes. answers to one minute, we'll get more questions in. Thank you. Could you repeat the question, Senator? We The question is, how do we shorten the time span to actually build this coalition? Because, frankly, the planet is uh, going to kill us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We're done. <laughs> so, um, this is exactly, this is exactly why, I'm, why I'm in the Green Party, right? Is that I, my analysis is... Uh, yeah, the Green Party uh, could use some really good organizers in it. There are some good organizers in it, but there's not enough, right? But what they do have is 20 years of building an electoral structure with no corporate money, almost all volunteer time, 
And frankly, it's a miracle, because if there's thousands of third parties in this country, right? They're the only one that has made it to the national level. And um, really, all progressives should be praising them. I know they're not, we're not perfect, right? But um, the fact that we were on 48 state ballots, that's historical for a third party, you know, except for, you know, since the Republican Party, right? So what I'm saying when I'm talking about these uh, independent third party primaries is saying that the structure is there. It's a vehicle, right? It is a vehicle, right? And we need to take that vehicle and take advantage of all the strengths of all parties. We need to take advantage of socialist alternatives media that's fantastic. We need to take advantage of uh, a lot of the policies that Peace and Freedom has. But we need to use a vehicle to uh, actually crack that uh, two-party duopoly as soon as possible because we have no time to wait, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is please... Um, if you're in third party politics, let's seriously talk about using the Green Party as a vehicle to break the system and put in a multi-party system like many, many other countries have. At that point, we can all, I'm more, there's nothing more that I'd love to see than more to multiple parties. I'm always going to be green. I see a lot of uh, my indigenous values in it. I love consensus that came from the Iroquois, democracy, number one value, all that good stuff. I love the Green Party, right? Everybody, I love the Green Party, I'm sure you all know that by now. <laughs> so, but, as a collective group that's being on the threat of being killed by this two-party system, we have to do something ASAP as soon as possible. I'll give it to one minute. We, we don't have time for like another election or a coalition or the next to, to elect a candidate that's progressive. The struggle is right now, every day. Every month over the last year is harder than the last. Than the last. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, the social movements have woken people up. Standing Rock was very critical, so that people pay attention to the next uh, leak that took place. Uh, but it means much more than that. And it means that all of us have to raise the issue of the environment ever more and fight for it. Uh, we can't Right now we have an administration that's destroying the EPA and doing much worse. The, the removal of bears ears and so on, I mean, we could talk forever about it, but it is, it is still capitalism. It was happening under Obama, it was happening under Clinton. Um, when the Fukushima disaster happened, I don't know if people know, but the nuclear lobbyists were right there in Washington to get insurance for their nuclear plant production. It's the system, it's the lobbyists. It's... Um, just a, a quick point, you know, climate change, if we get corporations out of politics, corporations are the ones that are causing climate change. Um, if we, time is of the essence, and if we can mobilize around um, corporate free organizations and corporate free candidates and elected officials, we're going to really make a difference in terms of people's consciousness and, you know, we, we have to do it now, and not just in election years. I agree with what Mick said. We need structures that go on in election years and non-election years. And um, we, we've got to do it, and we've got to do it now, absolutely. All right, thank you. So I'm going to ask all people who still have questions to keep it to a minute. I think Jake was next, and then we got Matt. Okay. Um. My name is Jake. Uh, I wanted to piggyback off of the question of time. I certainly see electoral social movements as almost four pillars, especially with the new explosion of social media, money, physical social movements, people in the streets, and then traditional media, uh, advertising, etc. How would each of you plan to bring those together. Unfortunately, I see the Green Party as something that has bylaws and structure. Uh, the People's Party is something that has emails, money, good social media, you know, very platform exploded with quality social media organizers, etc. And how do we bring those things together? Can we direct that to the two people, maybe? Yeah. One minute? Yeah. Seriously, one minute. 
<laughs> I promise. So that's what it's all about. It's about, you know, we each have different strengths, we have things to offer, and, um, and it's about pooling those resources, but it's, it's also uh, about the fact that if you're competing, you prevent a center of gravity from emerging, and, um, and your resources end up devoted towards fighting each other uh, rather than really uh, being pointed outward. So intra-movement conflict as opposed to, you know, outward energy. That's, I mean, that's where uh, an, ex an immense amount of the resources uh, of the movement go uh, today. And so that, that's exactly why we're trying to bring organizations, you know, including the Green Party, uh, that we are, you know, working with, uh, the Justice Party, Socialist Alternative, many other parties, but not just the parties, social movements too, you know, um, <laughs> academics, student groups, communities of colors, uh, unions, um, to, to have those conversations, you know. So you got to have the conversations and reach a baseline level of, you know, what, what is that you can do first. Right. So, um, exactly, <laughs> spot on, right? Everybody has their strengths strengths and what the Green Party has to offer is ballot access, a national committee, and structure, right? So um, like I was saying earlier, it's a multi-party system. Everything that we're talking about, like that is the answer. It's getting corporations out and it's creating a truly democratic system, right? So in order to do that in a two-party corporate system like this where there's only two other uh, two parties in their tiny little islands, right? We have this massive country and we have this corporate control over both of which we need a vehicle to be able to take it and ram it through the gates, right? Once we get in, we can do ranked choice voting, we can do uh, we can we can do all kinds of stuff, but we have to have a vehicle to break that, right? So what I would suggest is if you don't have ballot access in a certain state and you're running with the People's Party, Use our ballot access, run as a, a populist green, right? If it's socialist alternative, run as a, a, a socialist green, peace of freedom party, we can give you ballot access, peace of freedom green. Use the vehicle to break in and let's change it so we can all do what we really want to do. Thank you. Matt, if you could direct your question to specific um, speakers. Uh, yeah, so um, I just want to say, I, I think um, I'm by large in agreement with Gloria on a lot of the uh, aspects of where social movements fit in and I've heard a lot of discussion on you know breaking the duopoly and cracking the two-party system and changing the whole political thing um, you know but the economics and the social system isn't directed by the political structure that lays on top of it by and large that structure comes out of the underlying social system so I guess I have two questions then um, and one is actually directed I guess I'll put it to any of the, what I would consider the more electorally focused ones. Uh, and that is, what do you see the role of the party in social movements, very specifically? And then a question specifically to Gloria, given the recognition that you give to social movements, uh, how much energy does your particular party put into the electoral process, and would that energy be better redirected into the social movements? I think there's room for both because you don't vote all the time on elections. It's a certain particular period. I would like to say the thing also about social media was uh, the only race and the only campaign not mentioned in that an inch and a half thick voter handbook this last year in California was a presidential because it was denying any third party candidate the right to be uh, have a, a voice or even pay $25. Almost every vote that we got last year, the highest, as I said, in 40 years in California, was in the street, going to rallies, going to the communities, and giving people a flyer. It's the only way. And, and you still have to get out there to reach people who don't know about independent politics. I've been a candidate, and anyone who's run knows that when you go out to talk to people, they think there's only two candidates, only two parties. And we have to break that by reaching people. The other thing is, um, I'm very proud to say that with Roy, was it Roy Moore running in Alabama? We have a new group of youth in Birmingham from this year, people who reached out to us and we were working with them. They had a protest against Roy Moore. The only action that took place against them was that protest in Birmingham, Alabama. That's the future, is the youth and the youth in struggle. And you know there's millions who want to fight and win, along with everybody of us who's older. <laughs> So I would say the uh, role of the party, um, a party, is um, 
and electoral arm of the movement. Um, I, at this point, think we, we do not have um, a profound mass electoral arm of a movement, and our movement is, is not, um, is fractured and isn't mass enough. Um, I think for that reason, we need, and we need a party to overcome, we need at least one party to overcome at least one of the um, two establishment parties. And so, um, to me, it's building this movement first, and then having people come together and strategize how to build that party that we need that will overcome the uh, two-party system. Because otherwise, um, we're, you know, we could have a multi-party system, which I agree with, but if none of the multi-parties are going to be able to overcome at least one of the two parties, it's not going to, it's not going to um, help us. I agree. The, uh, the party needs to be an extension of the social movements. It needs to be a complete reimagining of what a party is. Uh, Democratic and Republican parties are not actually democratic themselves. The party needs to be democratic internally in its very structure. Because um, a non-democratic internal party is not capable of creating, of, of representing working people. It's only, it's... And, and that's why you see things like Democratic Republican parties hyper centralized. The Democratic Party, for example, it is um, Tom Perez, the chair alone, who controls the budget of the party. That's how centralized it is. Not even the DNC members have control over it. And so, in reimagining what a party is, you need a party that elects its leaders, that, uh, you need a party that elects its officers, you need a party that allows recall of those leaders and officers. Uh, when they stray from the vision of the membership, and you need a, a, a mechanism of holding candidates accountable to a platform as well, uh, and the ability to, re to, to disown candidates that, that stray from that. So I think those are all elements that you, that you need. So, to answer your question about um, electoral politics working in tandem with social movements, right? Um, I'm really lucky, and it's, there's a really good reason why I'm, in, why I'm in the Green Party. One of my mentors was C.T. Lawrence Butler, who was a co-founder of Food Not Bombs, right? Uh, he was part of the nuclear fights in the 70s, and he's the one that actually helped bring consensus to the Green Party. Before it was even the Green Party, it was the Green Committee, right? And the whole point that the Green Party got put together by the environmentalist slash nuclear movement anti-nuclear movement, was to do exactly that, to actually build an electoral arm of the movements, right? Now, obviously, after Nader left, that caused a real big problem, and we have been slowly bringing ourselves to get our act together since then. It's been tough, and we're lacking vision, honestly, right? But right now, there's uh, like six Bernie delegates that are running uh, in the Green Party of California. We have the analysis. Uh, there's four of us that are on the coordinating committee, and um, we intend to do that, is make it what it was meant to be, which is an electoral arm of the Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry we're not able to finish our stack because we're already past time. I believe there are two short announcements that we wanted to make. John? Uh, John Brennan, will you come up here and make your announcement, and then I have a quick announcement after that. Hi, everybody. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, as uh, Kevin pointed out, we need to collect a lot of signatures to get the Peace and Freedom Party candidates on the ballot, and we're going to start out on Sunday, this coming Sunday, isn't it? Yes. Uh, at 10.30 in the morning. We're having a meeting here, and then we're going to go out and do our initial petitioning. And we expect to be continuing that for a number of weeks. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, it's Saturday, John. Anyway, oh, it's Saturday, sorry. It's Saturday at 10.30. Uh, any of you uh, who would like to help out are more than welcome to join us. And we urge you to do so. As Kevin said, we need to get at least 2% of the vote in one of the statewide races in order to stay on the ballot. The Peace and Freedom Party has been on the ballot most years since 1968, 
and we perfectly are sure that we will continue to be on the mound. With your help. Thank you, John, and we love to keep you some freedom on the ballot, too, so let's all do that. And uh, I, my, my quick announcement is also, thanks to Kevin again, please do donate to corporate free candidates. I think that's the overwhelming resonance of clarity we hear among us and we heard from our candidates today. And I am delighted to see this is what a corporate free multi-party government would look like. This is what I want to hear and as a citizen, as a voter. So thank you all of you for being here and sharing your passion and that clarity in, in the approach to fix what ails us. Uh, my quick announcement is that the Green Party would like for all of you to come and party with us. We're putting the party back into the Green Party every once in a while. That's Tia's favorite thing. This Saturday, it's uh, 6 to 9 at Vito's Pizza in uh, Sunnyvale. So please check out our website. There's literature out there. And one call for you before you go. There is a bucket that's going around. And this phenomenal facility that we're in, um, thank you to our host, San Jose Peace and Justice Center. So we're going to ask you to please make a donation to keep this the home of progressives everywhere. Thank you. And Sharon's going to say a word. So, uh, yeah, so, so first, first, first of all, is this the bucket? Yeah, oh, so there's a bucket. Just please Thank you. Yeah, show that bucket. And so, two buckets. first, let's give a, a, a final round of applause. signing up for something, or doing something, or donating. Okay, now there's, there's, there are various ways, right? The first we have the orange sign-up sheets, which are, are just a sign-in, so make sure that if you, if you came in and you didn't sign in, please sign in. Your, the, the email addresses will be shared among uh, the Peace and Justice Center and, and the organizations represented by, by the speakers. Um, remember that, that to, to, we, you know, and then, then you can speak to individuals from the various organizations about actually joining those organizations. Remember that you can join, for example, the Green Party or the Peace and Freedom Party, and that doesn't limit you from, from not joining the South Bay Progressive Alliance. So you can join multiple entities, particularly the non-party entities. Okay, so sign up. You, we've got to get people involved. And then, of course, take this message to your friends, to your relatives, get them to sign up and, and tell them the story, what you've heard here tonight. What we can, we can change this country. Yeah. We can do it. Woo!